Welcome to God's Business, where I interview the top Christian influencers, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders on how you can create not just a good business, but God's business, where he's the multiplier of your success. I have the honor of having my favorite speaker here, so hopefully I'll be doing the least of the speaking. My wife, Amanda Bailey, who's the COO of our company, but also the COO of our household as well. We got married at 20 and 18 years old, went straight into business because we had no other options, didn't think about anything else. And if it wasn't for her, we would never have built anything that we have here today. I wouldn't be the person that I am today. And I believe that that's the way that God designed it as well. So we're excited to break down some really cool things together and hopefully not fight too much live. But if we do, it'll be entertainment for you. So you'll just have to see and watch till the very end. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm excited for this episode. Um, back in the day, we used to have the Power Couple podcast. Well, it wasn't a podcast, but we had like a little section. Yep. Um, but I think... But it was tough because every single time we would yes. do an episode, we, we would, would always fight right before. Yes, we would fight right So before I was kind of sick and tired of it. I'm like, why do yeah. we keep... Why does this keep making us have conflict? I'd rather not do the show. But you know what's funny is there's another podcast that I listen to called As For Me In My House, and they have the same issue. They always get in a fight before their podcast. It's just, it's a thing. But we didn't get in a fight before this podcast. We did not. But I don't think we had enough time to either. I think our lives are very different than back then because back then we didn't have Kingston. And so I could commit to doing a weekly podcast. But now I think doing a weekly show is, and committing to it because it's like a long-term thing. But we still struggled with the weekly show back then. That's why it was so hard. If yeah. You're like, we got to do this weekly show. <laughs> And then it was also tough because we'd have all these amazing people, super high level people that we looked up they to that are like, it. oh, I've been listening to your Power Couple episodes and we're like, "Yeah, oh, this is so impactful, but yeah." And I think care. why people liked our podcast back then is because so many of our guys and, and businessmen in general don't work with their wives because usually they're running the business and their wives are either doing something else or they're taking care of the kids full time. And so, you know, we always had that struggle. And this is why we define power couple is two people coming together to accomplish one like-minded vision, both people using their own talents and abilities because, you know, it's not like every woman does not need to work in the business. And honestly, I think I'm even kind of moving out of that phase of being in the business every day because, you know, we have a son and we want to have more kids. And so it's just like, Someone's got to raise the kids. Someone's got to do it. So, um, and I absolutely love it. But, I mean, you know, the first two years of Kingston's life, we barely worked. Like, we worked very well. I think that's good for people in the very beginning is the power couple dynamic is two people with two visions. So no matter what your guys' visions are, coming together with one like-minded vision, using your skills, talents, and abilities to be able to Mm -hmm. get there. So whether that is both working in the business, that's great. You'll love these episodes. Because we already know that they're those are the people that are listening because they know it's not perfect. Is there a way to make it perfect? It's like, well, there's a way to make it effective and, and make it actually grow together where you guys are growing together in your relationship by building the business. But also if you're building the business or your wife is, whatever the dynamic is, this works as well because it's about you guys coming together and using what you're doing right now to serve that bigger vision that God's put inside of your guys' hearts that you've aligned on and each piece of it serves. So it's good for both. A lot of times if you're a man and you're going to to work or business, that can be an outlet to get away from the household. And so it's like integrating you back in where they actually know what the heck you're doing. Because a lot of times the the wife or the spouse has no clue even what the husband does at work because Mm -hmm. they come home and they don't want to talk about the problem. They don't even want to talk about work anymore. Yeah. So it's like, what do you do all day with your life? And how is that actually aligned? Mm Mm-hmm. And then also just getting that connectiveness of vision. Because I think that's so big is guys will come and they'll be like, I have this vision, this is what I want to do. And it's like very abrasive. I mean, you know how I am. When I come out of a work environment where I'm like making progress, if I don't make that transition well, I could bring that into every single thing that we're doing. And it's like really intense Mm -hmm. compared to like normal life flow. Yeah. And I think this is a good segue because we just got back from Hobby Lobby headquarters, learning from David Green, um, Mark Green, and just the whole 
Hobby Lobby family and Hobby Lobby. the Hobby Lobby family, <laughs> the green family, whatever. It was absolutely amazing. We took so many good takeaways. One of them being the second day after we learned their story and learned all about their family, we created our own like generational legacy and our family values. And so we came up with our five family values, our vision statement, our mission statement, and it was like the symbol of our family as well. So do you want to share what that was? Yeah, the, the symbol we're still kind of working on. Like I want this like David and Goliath picture. So I think the best thing is going to be mid journey. Shout out to them because their AI can come up with something really cool. But that was kind of the thought process I had around. I'm trying to make it not just masculine. I'm thinking young daughter, young woman, you know, great, great granddaughter, great, great grandson. How can they actually embody this and understand it? What's so cool is that Kingston, he uses all these blocks and stacks things right now. That's like his thing. Mm -hmm. So automatically that inspired us because my son always stacks things and it falls over. And he knows now that you have to create a firm foundation to build something upon. So our like analogy that we're using to describe what the core values are is really that firm foundation. Taking the scripture about do you build your house on sand or do you build it on a firm foundation where you can actually, it's not tossed and turned by the wind or the storms of life. And that's what the values are for. And if you change these values, it'll be like changing a foundation, which imagine changing the foundation on a house, just ripping it out. It ain't going to work well. And so that was our analogy to kind of explain what those values are is, mm -hmm. again, building these values are that firm foundation that allows you to build something really, really big and great on. And yeah. inside of those values, we had five. With these five, we had a scripture with them and a story specifically. And, and even each part of that has a scriptural backing about like, you know, write it down so that they may run, on, like, run with it. So like, yeah. how can we write it down and communicate through story in a way where the next generation can run with that thought or idea. Mm -hmm. So number one though was faith. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Having having faith as the the foundation of yep. everything. And then love. Love. Generosity. Mm-hmm. Health. Yes. And what? Discipline. Yeah. Discipline. And, and this kind of boiled down. It was really difficult to find. It's like you could only pick five and there's so many good words. And we had like thirty other people who did their vision and, and like values and so we got to kind of like be like oh I like it from there but I think it was cool because one of the things that we had was health and that was not very common yeah no like only one other person I think in the whole group had health but I think it's so cool because we had health like not only honoring our body with like what we're putting in our body and like exercising and take caring of our temple but also like um, being pure and staying away from sexual immorality. And that's also a part of health. So I thought yeah. that was pretty cool. And the cool. mental side, like the mental side is so big. Health is just something that isn't a partnership with someone else. And I think that that's so cool. It's like, it's you and God in your mental state, in your emotional state, mm -hmm. in, in the state. times when you're alone. Yeah. Your physical state, when you're just alone, this is where health is done. And I just thought that that was such a great proving ground almost like when david was out there at first when he was fighting the lions and the bears it wasn't like he had an audience of people like he did with goliath and so it was like his discipline in that if he would have ran from the lions and the bears when no one was watching mm -hmm. then it would have set him up with this confident capability physical capability but also mentality where he knew he could go out there and execute and i believe that that's why the health one is such a cool thing i feel like it's weird because i also would think like this world's going to pass away. The health part isn't going to really matter anymore. Yet it really disciplines you for this life. Like, yeah. will you wake up and, and, or will you push yourself in a workout? Will you push yourself or, you know, when you're all alone and you have no one watching and you, oh, God's forgiven me. Like, will you choose to stay pure in your relationship? Mm -hmm. And I think that that was a really, <clears throat> really cool part of it. So faith, love, generosity, health and then discipline yeah and then our our mission statement i thought was really cool as well because it's kind of based on kingston which kind of well again, say, say the vision first you say the vision you okay. wrote it out okay the vision is um generational legacy impacting nations to bring heaven to earth yeah and heaven to earth is the big one for us mm -hmm. is that we want our household to be this sanctuary of a reflection of heaven and we believe that that's like the standard that we want to live by so even right now, like 
I am struggling with this like cough and I just went through this bad thing. But that's an experience, but that's not what we want our legacy to be. Our legacy is that we are demanding that our household would live like heaven. When people would walk in, they would be healed. They would be set free. They would have a different mindset. They would feel peace. Things like this, even this cough, wouldn't exist. Mm-hmm. And so that's our standard. And we're not going to allow our experiences to define our standards. We're going to raise our experiences to our standard and our belief system. Mm-hmm. I think that that's so important. Well, with also communicating that, hey, like I'm having this experience still. So don't hate yourself if you're having an experience. Yet we're not going to just change what we believe based on an experience. Yeah. And so I think that that heaven to earth piece is like such a key thing is that I, if we're called to bring heaven to earth and, yeah. and pray on earth as it is in heaven. Exactly. How do we train people to believe and understand even what that means? Yeah. Because right? a lot of people don't even know what heaven means. No. And, and it's the, like the impossible. Like with God, all things are possible. And when you believe like, okay, is this in heaven? No. Okay. Well, then why is it manifesting here right now? Um, and so like we are called as sons and daughters of God who have... We are seated in heavenly places. How can we bring that here into the physical realm? And we've yep. seen, you know, a lot of physical healings in our life. Um, I mean, thousands and just so many miraculous things. And the power of prayer is so, like, the power of prayer is so powerful. And yeah. So many people are like, oh, I'll pray for you. It's like, no, I'm going up and I'm praying to God and I'm commanding these certain things that are happening on earth to be gone yep. and it's incredible to see what happens when you do that well and that's what's cool about knowing the will of god yeah. if it's a promise like hey this is what i died for then that is the will of god yep so you don't have to ask for the will of god you command the will of god mm-hmm. which is cool because you can be more confident you're not like god give me a sign if i should buy this car or this car when you're praying the will of god it's like you're commanding the will of God on the earth because you're called to pray on earth as it is in heaven. Mm-hmm. So I think that's so cool to have that confidence. And part of that is knowing biblically what are the thousands of promises that God's promised. Yeah. Because if you don't know what God's even promised you, then you don't even have an expectation. You have no clue mm-hmm. how to even believe for it, have a standard for it, fight for it. And I believe that that's so important. And then mm-hmm. mission statement, which one cool thing that they talked about with this is that the vision statement is something that can be carried out for a thousand generations. Yeah. And be a big enough vision that it's like only God can do it, right? So yes. influencing the nations with this, like different countries, that's a big deal. Like you would have mm-hmm. to have influence and be able to talk to every major world leader and have them communicate it to their people. Mm-hmm. Whereas our actual mission statement was the day-to-day kind of thing that yeah. we're carrying out. And go ahead and tell them that one. Uh, be bold as a lion. Yeah. And, and it comes from that, the righteous are as bold as a lion. Yeah. Yes. And that came from Kingston too, which was a cool thing for us because maybe some of the other people out there that have kids, you had kind of these themes for their their scripture over their life or their name or something like that. And for Kingston, we had the, the righteous is, are as bold as a lion. And so it kind of showed me that, man, this was God because this is still on our heart. So it was like, okay, with all of these things, now go out there and be bold in everything that you do. Be bold inside of your faith and what you believe and what you stand for and standing on these core values all of these things go out there and just like do it with absolute boldness. Mm -hmm. And I believe that really represents our family a ton too. It definitely represents our family and we need to have Kingston too. So like, we're like, we are going to have a king. But it is also the goal because you look at David, David Green. Yes. uh, And with him, they went through a thing with Hobby Lobby where they had all these medications, I guess. And this was like, probably everyone else will know this better than me. This was birth control, day after pill. Yeah, that they had to provide for people yes. in their pharmacy that's on the actual campus. And they said, no, we're not. this is against our beliefs. We don't believe in this stuff, so we're not going to carry it. And they got, they got charged $1.3 million a day until they would carry it. So the, every day that they didn't. So they went to all their family, but because their family knew their core values, they all unanimously with 50 people basically said, no, let's not do this. Let's literally lose the company and everything that we've put into this to stand on this one thing. Yes. And I think that that's so cool because when you don't know what you said yes to, it's tough to say no to things. And I've caught myself do that. It's like, be bold. Be as bold as a lion. Be bold in what though? And I saw them on something so maybe minor where they could have been like, hey guys, we're going to carry it, but just keep it in the back. Yeah. $1.3 million a day is a lot. Like 
even if it's just a million, that's 365 million in a year. That's a lot. And to think that they would walk through that and get denied so many times and just be like, we'll lose the company on that made me want to, it was inspiring to me. So just some other takeaways from being at Hobby Lobby. One of the things that really stood out to me was number one, the humbleness of David Green. I mean, they make, they're making $8, million, $8 billion this year and they're going to give away five, $500 million. $500 million. Um, so they give away 50% of their profits and it's just amazing to see how God's continually bless them when they are giving above, you know, a lot of Christians think, oh, I give, you know, 10%. They're like, it, this is God's business. I'm not an owner. I'm a steward of this company. Yeah. I'm not the owner of this business. God is the owner. And so just knowing like, hey, how, if this is God's business, what decisions do we make differently? And also just giving above and knowing like God's got it. Like who cares? You yeah. know, like, yeah, yeah. you want to live a nice life, but at the same time, like we're storing up riches in heaven. So just like the perspective and to see how God's blessed them with like literally four generations, he's 82 years old. He's got more energy than most of the people at Hobby Lobby. He works six days a week. So it's like whatever he's doing is freaking working because most people at 82 are either dead or are in a nursing home or have other people taking care of them all day long. Like it's crazy to see just what happens when you live a godly life. Like that's, yeah. that's the legacy that he's leaving and inspiring so many people. And John C. Maxwell was there in the room with us learning from him. That was incredible. Yeah. And that was the first time they'd seen each other and that was impactful. Yeah. That was like once in a lifetime experience. You recorded it too. Yeah. I recorded John saying how impacted he was he said he never felt closer to jesus ever in his life yeah. than being in that room yeah listening to david and with david as well like everything's about reaching the lost for jesus mm -hmm. like that is his number one goal everything and like their money goes to eternal impact so it's like will this matter in a thousand years is always a question of his that i thought was really good his contentment mm -hmm. he's like why would i want this money there's nothing that this world has to offer that i want that was crazy also, even around giving, like you talked about how blessed they are from giving, but he talked about when he's not doing it for that. Yeah. And I thought that that was very interesting because God says, test me in this with giving, which is great. But even when he said he closed on Sunday, they lost revenue. Yes. Like it hurt the business. No, sometimes like, I want to go to Hobby Lobby or Mardell and I'm like, they're closed on Sunday. Yeah. And if, he's just like, if it doesn't cost me something, it's not really a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And so for him, he doesn't care if it helps him or costs him something. He cares about being obedient above yeah. all of that. And we know that in obedience, there's blessing, but he's okay if there's not. Like mm -hmm. if it costs him everything, like the obedience of standing up for the 1.3 million thing. And I feel like a lot of people are just like, well, if it's going to get me my blessing, then I'll do it. And it's like he's at this place where kind of like the Israelites were at, or at least the, I'll have to jump in, we'll do like an in-depth study on it at some point, is like there became a point where if God's presence wasn't in the promised land, they didn't want to go to the promised land. So everyone wants God to lead them to the promised land, this place that's amazing, flowing with milk and honey. But it's actually when you get to the point where you're like, if your presence is in the wilderness, I want to be there over the promised land. And that's the place where like real blessing comes from. It's not, God, if, if you lead me to the place of blessing, I'll be so happy. It's like, no, God, if your presence is in poverty, I'll, I'll be there. Like, I don't care where, wherever you're at, that's where I want to be. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what I saw from him as well that I thought was super impactful. Yeah. Just yesterday I was getting a massage and the lady was telling me how every year she takes like uh, a month or two of a sabbatical because, you know, she's doing like physical labor all day long massaging. And I mean, God's just like completely blessed her business. She's always booked up. It's so hard to get into her. And I just thought about that. I was like, whoa, like we've been doing business for so long and we've maybe max taken off five days of work ever. And I'm like, whoa, like maybe that's something we should like consider. Like it just like kind of hit me. Like I've always felt like, oh, if we don't 
do all of these things all the time, then like we're not going to make progress. But at the same time, um, you know, you get burnout or you get aggravated or you kind of, you know, just you don't recharge the way that you should. Yeah, we take like a one one or two days every week, you know, on the weekends to like be with family and like rest But still and we're stuff. not like fully turned off. Yeah, I just thought that was like a really good thing. I'm like, huh, because like our pastors, you know, they take sabbaticals every year because you're always giving, you're always pouring out. And when you're on, like you want to perform. But then when are you ever getting like recharged? And obviously it's biblical. Like they worked for six years and on the seventh year, they didn't work at all. And so, I don't know. I was just thinking about that. I thought, huh, I wonder like what would happen. And I, I, we didn't get to ask David that. Like, has he taken a sabbatical? But I, I'm sure he probably has. Obviously he honors like the Sabbath. Yeah. Sounds crazy. I know. I know. I would love to see what that would look like. Any other things that you learned from David that you would be doing differently that kind of just changed you with like parenting, family, how to raise our son? I think the biggest thing wasn't necessarily even with Kingston because he's three. And so it's like, okay, I could be a good example and all this stuff. Like I want to pass these things down to him. And I think that's really big like having these core values, writing them out, making them, like building things for them. I love that they had a Bible that every person in the family had and everyone signed it. Those were great. But some of the biggest things that hit me were like his mom tithed off the things that she got and like she was so giving and like how that had set him up for this success. And I think they had talked about that practicing parents of faith but generosity those two things were like the most influential things on kids Mm -hmm. was like having them practice generosity like the hundred dollar bill thing there was things like that that were really big but the biggest thing for me was really around is the things that i'm giving to and doing make relevant in a thousand years Mm -hmm. and that to me was like that first day was really convicting for me i have so many notes on my phone that i still need to break down and the second day of implementation was great Because I knew exactly what our mission, vision, values, like I was on it. Like that was sick. I was on it, dude. But the first day, it was like a new lens that you look at life through. And it just like ruined me. Mm -hmm. Like if we pulled out our our booklet, it was like, here's like 15 things that you can write down what you're doing, what you want to do, and circle three of them that you want to focus on. Oh, yeah. And I was like, two of them were, I was doing well. Like spousal alignment was one of them. There was like 13 I was doing bad. So I was like, wow. I feel like depressed, but also at the same time, I felt like peace. Like I wanted to just sit there and rest in the moment and just be like, wow, I failed at this, God, but like I'm hopeful. One of the things that I feel like I really convicted me was him talking about giving to your kids because you just have all these different things of like, hey, like, our ceiling is your floor. Like if we're accumulating like all this wealth here on earth and all these real estate stuff, it's like, okay, obviously you have it in a trust. You're like, yeah, you give it to your kids. Like who, who else are you going to give it to? But now it has me like really thinking because they put all of their stuff in a trust and they give 50% of it away. And each kid, if they want to work at Hobby Lobby or whatever company they have, they have to, that's how they make their money through the company is by working. They don't just get handed money. Yeah. They do They do get some certain gifts at certain ages. 25, 35, 45. Yeah. But, you know, a lot of trust fund kids get like so much money at like 18 and different ages that are just, it's so much that they don't know how to do with it. And then it actually ruins them. This is why a lot of families don't continue continue with their generational legacy because The parents built this whole wealth and then the kids just like destroy it all because it went to them. So I thought that was really cool. And then also with that trust, having giving parameters. So we wrote down like, you know, once we're gone, like, and they have to vote on where this money's going in the trust every single year, what are they going to be doing? So it's like, what are you not going to give to? What are you going to give to? And every time you give a kid something, you also take something away from them and so I thought that was really interesting. And just, you know, how we're raising Kingston. Like the other day I bought him a bunch of these um, magnet tiles and he absolutely loves them. And he was like, we need more, we need more, like to build, you know, more houses. And I said, 
Well, what we can do is we can sell some of your old toys that you don't play with anymore and we can make money that way. So it's just like, listen, my money is not my money. It's, it's all God's money and we want to be good stewards of it. And so, yeah, if you want those tiles, like let's sell other things and then you can buy them. But I'm not just going to buy you every single toy that you want in this world. And for someone whose love language is giving gifts, um, Kingston has a lot of toys from us, from grandma and grandpa. And so it's like, how can we be better stewards and, and not feel like we have to have, give our kids everything they want in this world, but teach them how to find the money and be resourceful. Yeah. I think that probably convicted everyone. Yeah. That was pretty intense. It was like, we, I mean, the kids literally had to sign over billions, a billion dollar inheritance mm-hmm. and be like, no, this is God's. I'm going to sign over all my rights to this. I'm going to work in this company if I want to make money from this family or I'm going to go do my own thing mm-hmm. with these few gifts. If I have a ministry, I need to present it just like any other ministry to get given to. And there were strict parameters around it. And that was definitely convicting. And like you said, when you give a kid something, you take something away from them. Yes. So... And it was cool that the kids received it. And I think that was like showed the fruit of the family aspect because there has to be bond, connection, like trust or else if you did that, they'd be super upset. But you saw like three generations in a room Mm -hmm. that at least appeared to be very, very cool. Yeah. And I think, you know, like when you see Donald Trump's kids, I always remembered the story that... Um, when the kids were young, they had to sit in economy and Donald Trump and his wife sat in first class and the kids were like, how come we don't get to sit up in first class with you guys? And it's like, because you, you have to pay for it. Like, this is something that you have to, to earn and work towards. We're not just going to like give you every privilege. Like we worked hard for this. And so I, I thought that was really interesting because when you come from a wealthy family, usually those kids are extremely spoiled and everything's given to them and they never experienced anything hard in their life. And so, um, I think Brandon Pullen asked this question, uh, maybe not at this event, but at other events of like how, how, like what's the balance of, you know, our kids are growing up in a very blessed, nice home, nice area. Everything's amazing. How do we create those hard things in their life when they don't, have anything hard like how do we create those little hard things to to build resilience to build those skill sets to that we need in this world well i think that concludes today's episode hopefully you guys got a lot of value off of some of the takeaways that we learned from hobby lobby and the green family and just how they they live a um a godly life and how they parent how they are creating a generational legacy um And so if you guys have any questions, any other things that you want us to talk about in further episodes, definitely drop those below if you are watching on YouTube um, or connect with us on Instagram at Amanda Barely at Nicholas Barely. Make sure to subscribe, rate, and review, and we'll see you on the next episode. She crushed it.